Medical education is honored to showcase leaders in the UCSF School of Medicine who embody our vision for living the UCSF values through cultivating the ideal learning and care ecosystem. We hope you'll be inspired by these leaders' commitment to engage in creative problem solving and continuous quality improvement so that our medical students, residents and fellows, faculty members, and all those who support our patients can learn, grow, and thrive. Welcome, my name is Catherine Lucy. I'm the Vice Dean for Education and the Executive Vice Dean for the School of Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. And I'm delighted to introduce you to the work that we're doing currently to optimize the learning and healthcare ecosystem. We at UCSF pride ourselves on a community that's willing to tackle some of the most challenging problems in education. And we believe that in 2018 and beyond, the most important thing that we can do is to create an environment and an ecosystem in which all who are present, from patients to students to residents, faculty, and all other health professionals who help us provide excellent care to our patients, um, thrive in the environments that we've created and learn something every day that will advance their ability to become someone's beloved healthcare provider, someone's beloved physician. In 2018, the School of Medicine Medical Education Program uh, launched an educational retreat focused on optimizing the learning and healthcare ecosystem. We undertook this work in collaboration with faculty from undergraduate medical education and graduate medical education, as well as our students, our residents, our wonderful educational staff, and administrators in the health system who helped us use lean technology to further define the problem of why the learning and healthcare ecosystem sometimes is not as ideal as we'd want it to be. As we worked through this problem in very targeted strategies during that day, we identified three critical areas for optimizing the learning and healthcare ecosystem. We need an ecosystem that is composed of people who all understand the importance of learning on a daily basis if we are truly to provide the most outstanding care to our patients. And we need that ecosystem to be based in an environment where technology, workflow, and the physical environment is constructed to support that learning. Our three major pillars in this work are the pillars to learn, grow, and thrive critical elements to all people's success within the learning and healthcare ecosystem. Learning in the learning and healthcare ecosystem occurs when outstanding faculty and people on the team ask excellent questions that provoke all of us to dive a little deeper into our understanding of what is happening with our patients, what is our understanding of the current state of medical knowledge, and what we might do to advance medical knowledge even beyond what it is today. Growth in the learning and healthcare ecosystem occurs when outstanding faculty and residents interact with our learners and help them through coaching and feedback to improve every day, to catalyze their own learning, um, and to actually try things that stretch their competencies so they can take it to the next level. And thriving in the learning and healthcare ecosystem occurs when all in the environment and the system in which we work are committed to ensuring that the Work that we do occurs in an environment where people are, feel safe to learn, uh, feel secure in admitting their lack of knowledge, and um, in which they actually feel each day that they're a little bit better today than they were yesterday. If we can get all of our environment to focus on these three pillars of learn, grow, and thrive, we can truly transform the learning and healthcare ecosystem. I'm delighted today that you'll get an opportunity to hear from some of our master educators who have spent a great deal of time thinking about these topics and perfecting an approach which may be helpful to you as you work on your learning and healthcare ecosystem. We will hear from our Associate Dean for Competency Assessment and Professional Standards, Karen Hauer, who will talk to us about a new paradigm of assessment that will help our students and our residents grow, assessment for learning. Next you will hear from Chair of Neurology, Dr. Andy Josephson, who is a master educator in both undergraduate medical education and graduate medical education. Andy will talk to us about how he has developed strategies to incorporate effective questioning to help students and residents learn in the clinical environment. Questioning that actually catalyzes their reading, questions that helps them stretch their understanding, and helps them dive deeper into the competencies they need to provide excellent patient care. And he does so in a way that allows all of this learning to occur in the very busy clinical environment. I think you'll really enjoy his presentation. Next, you'll hear from Associate Dean for Graduate Medical Education and Continuing Medical Education, Robert Barron, 
who will talk to us about how accreditation standards through the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education um, can, in fact, help us in our work on optimizing the learning and healthcare ecosystem. The ACGME's CLEAR program, Clinical Learning Environment Review, has prioritized elements of uh, resident wellness, patient safety and quality, and interprofessional teamwork as key building blocks for an optimal learning and healthcare ecosystem. Bobby will talk about the work that the ACGME has done, but also the work that UCSF has done in meeting the clear expectations and accelerating our work to achieve the goals of the uh, positive learning environment. Lastly, we will hear from Meg McNamara, um, an expert in undergraduate medical education who has recently taken on the role of residency program di director in the Department of Pediatrics. Meg has done outstanding work in understanding the challenges and barriers to a thriving educational environment. She has worked with residents and students in pediatrics and across the institution to identify strategies that help us develop healthy ecosystems in which people thrive, have physically excellent health, emotional stability, uh, and are excited about learning and helping our patients on a daily basis. The work we are doing to optimize the learning and healthcare ecosystem is essential to our ability to fulfill our responsibilities to provide the highest quality patient care for our patients. Care that is safe, effective, delivered in a way that's culturally sensitive, and aligned with our patients' goals. We invite you to join us in this work on the learning and healthcare system. If you do so, we believe that we have tremendous opportunity to truly transform American medical education and American healthcare. Thank you for joining us today, and I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. I would argue the way that we currently conduct clerkship grading interferes with students' learning, contributes to the high stress they feel at this early point in their learning, and creates inequitable learning environments. What if we were to rethink clerkship grading toward a system that emphasizes assessment for learning? Assessment for learning means that the assessment process itself helps students to learn more and learn better. Assessment for learning means that each student would be thinking about how to improve on an individual basis. The adage that assessment drives learning definitely holds true in the core clerkships. We hear from many students that they change their behaviors in ways that may not be the best for their learning, but that they think will help them earn a better grade. Taken together, these stories illustrate the ways in which students' motivations are strongly affected by the ways that we evaluate and grade them. So what is the way forward out of this current situation in which our clerkship evaluation and grading processes are interfering with our students' learning? We need to think about a developmental system that embraces the concept of assessment for learning. Each student would be aware of where they are in their learning and development and where they want to get to next. This would involve reflection by the student with clear expectations for performance, frequent observation of the student performing the skills that are right at that edge of their learning, and a lot of feedback from their supervisors. Students could take this information, working closely with a coach or mentor, to assess where they are and make a learning plan going forward, really capturing that spirit of continuous improvement that we embrace in the Bridges curriculum. We can ask questions in the right way of our learners and in that sense really have an opportunity to use this as a technique in today's learning environment to get points across. So of course this occurs in all sorts of learning environments, in the outpatient learning environment, in small groups, in large group settings, but I'm going to focus on the learning environment where this probably is most well known and that's on the inpatient setting. We are, as a leader of this team, having to teach on multiple different levels, both throughout our medical profession and interprofessionally. This can be quite a challenge. So what's the context of the day? 
The day is that we're rounding on four new patients. That's what we did on rounds just yesterday, and 10 follow-up patients are on our primary neurology service. So we only have 120 minutes to see all these patients, go through their plans, meet with them and their family, write orders, and also we have to have time for teaching. This is the first person we see in the morning shortly after 9 o'clock, and what happens is the sub I presents the patient to me uh, and to our entire group in the hallway. We then examine the patient together in their room and then leave the room after we've talked to the patient, talked about a plan, written some orders. We leave the room. We step outside in the hallway to talk about the patient and to huddle up. And here is where we have just a few minutes, a few moments to teach. And so I would argue here's where questions can be very, very helpful. It is a setting with a diverse set of learners, as we've talked about, and it is a time-pressured setting where we want to be able to teach not just about our orders and what we're going to do about the patient, but through a variety of wide-ranging topics. We want to explore basic science topics, uh, in this case relevant to stroke, the pathophysiology of what's gone on in the brain. On the first day of the rotation, I tell everyone I'm going to be asking a number of questions. And why am I doing this? I'm not doing this to demean you. I'm not doing this even to understand if your answers are correct. I'm doing this to be able to give short teaching points, short learning points to a broad range of audience over a relatively short period of time. In addition, it's an opportunity for students to get good at this skill and also for them to be able to teach the rest of the team. I'm doing this for them to improve the learning environment. On day one, I comment that this is a risk-free learning environment. I encourage active questioning as an accomplishment in itself. Whether or not you get the right answer, it's a skill that we want to impart on learners for the rest of their lives. A curiosity where they'll see a patient and then be able to then generate a series of questions and get to those answers to broadly understand the disease state and the patient. So from the get-go, I spend a lot of time talking about things I don't know questions I don't know the answer to, or errors I've made in the past in these types of situations. In that way, I tend to diffuse this opportunity of people to think, oh, the attending knows everything, so we're all set from the beginning as various learners at different stages in our training. In 2002, the ACGME began a program called the Clinical Learning Environment Review, uh, also known as CLEAR. Uh, in 2016, the results of the first 300 CLEAR visits were published, uh, and I'll review that in a moment. Uh, this one being the most important one that suggests the quality of the environment in which you learn how to be a physician predicts over the course of a career uh, the quality and safety with which you uh, provide care for patients. Now, as a result of this kind of database, and again, the main principle being that the character of and the quality and safety of the setting in which you train predicts your future practice, um, led to the development of the Clinical Learning Environment and Review Program uh, by the ACGME. Uh, and the, in the original format, uh, these uh, multi-day multi visits um, uh, with multiple visitors, uh, analogous in many respects to something uh, to the kind of visits the Joint Commission uh, does, uh, focused uh, meeting with residents, faculty, uh, hospital leadership, uh, and on, on trips and visits to the wards, uh, focused on patient safety, healthcare quality, including health disparities. At UCSF, we've had two of these, first in 2014 uh, and more recently in the spring of 2017. And what they found was they could define four themes uh, in which almost all clinical learning environments uh, were deficient. Uh, one was they found that resident and fellow engagement in patient safety and quality uh, was uh, not as fully developed as it could be. That number two, that in many institutions, and in most institutions, graduate medical education planning was being done independent of the institution's strategic uh, priorities uh, and focus. Number three, that the faculty were not keeping up. Uh, and then finally, there was no strategic 
uh, approach to uh, interprofessional uh, practice and collaboration across the health professions. Uh, recently, the ACGME has uh, uh, recruited and identified a group of eight institutions to serve as a collaborative uh, that they've entitled the Pursuing Excellence in the Clinical Learning Environment Collaborative. And UCSF is uh, pleased to be uh, one of the uh, eight sites and the only one on the West Coast and the West region. Uh, the principle of this work is really to help uh, the ACGME uh, by having each institution really develop uh, innovative programming uh, in uh, four areas that I'll define in a moment uh, to really think about what the clear visit should look like uh, in the future uh, generations. Uh, what's interesting about this program is that it's a full-fledged uh, collaboration between the health system and the GME uh, leadership, in our case, uh, the health, UCSF Health System and the School of Medicine. Our ultimate aim is to integrate healthcare delivery uh, 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 by integrating GME and clinical care in a way that uh, accounts for measurable improvements in both the learner experience uh, and competence and also in patient care. So the focus of my talk today is on thriving. And what does it mean to thrive? It means to grow and to develop and to flourish. We know that personal resilience is an essential quality in order to thrive in our chosen profession. The recent work in mindfulness and in positive psychology are truly remarkable, and the scientific evidence base behind these is very impressive. We know that there are systemic solutions to improve wellness. There are structural and organizational factors that can be brought to bear to improve things and to promote thriving. For those of us in the clinical work environment, we know that the options to simply work harder and work longer are no longer viable. Then there is the issue of burnout, and this is not simply a term. So what does burnout mean? Well, it means that there is a predisposition to failed relationships and substance abuse, depression, suicide. In terms of professional ramifications, it results in decreased quality of care. We know that the threats to wellness have deep roots across our profession, throughout the entire institution, across the country, and starting in medical school, worsening in training, and continuing through early, mid, and even senior levels of our profession. We uh, conducted working groups and focus groups and a number of interviews, and what we learned was very concerning. There are over 400 physician suicides in this country every year. That's twice the risk of the general population. A study that was conducted last year in 2017 of 1,500 residents across U.S. training programs revealed that 45% of them sometimes or always were depressed. 11% considered suicide. And we know that there are structural and organizational factors to improve well-being. We also need to advocate for better use of our interprofessional teams so that people are, have the ability to work to the top of their license. This would improve efficiency. It would also improve a sense of self-efficacy and satisfaction. As an academic center, we need to assure that we create structures to explicitly preserve teaching and learning. In this way, we can work together to create a place where people can thrive, where we have an ideal ecosystem to learn and work. So with the collective talent and skill in this room, between medical educators and clinical service leaders, let's lead the way. <laughs>